in the Talks for Change series by SciMag. Um, tonight's theme will be the right to work and um, our previous um, talk, which was in March, was in February, um, was on um, housing and our next talk in April will be on health and this is all for asylum seekers. Um, I was hoping to hand over to the chairs of um, SIMAG to introduce but they were unable to make it so I'm just going to give you a bit of a background about what SIMAG is and why they're doing the talk. So this series of public education events is typical of what SIMAG's tried to do in South Yorkshire over the 10 years that they've been in existence. It's, it's an entirely volunteer-led organisation and it is migrant-led um, and the majority of the office and executive have lived experience with the asylum system. Um, I'm just kind of stepping in to cover for the host. Um, SIMAC is independent, they are political and they fight tirelessly, tirelessly for the rights of migrants and refugees. They believe in open debate and discussion about rights in the asylum system. And I hope that you will learn a lot tonight and, and more importantly be inspired by the speakers to join in and support SIMAG in our actions and campaigns. I know that this has been a really difficult week for a lot of us. Um, and I think that we all need an event like this at the moment, you know, for a bit of inspiration. So we'll have a series of speakers, um, which I'll introduce and then a Q&A at the end. Um, but before we get started, I just thought I'd give a quick over, overview of the asylum system in the UK, for those of you that don't know. Um, some of you may, in which case, bear with me. Um, so to go right back to the basics, an asylum seeker is, you know, when someone arrives in the UK and they want to become a refugee, they become an asylum seeker. And um, in order to meet like basic living needs, the Home Office provides um, accommodation and financial support. The financial support is only £39.63 a week and people are put into um, accommodation across the country. Um, and this could be, you know, anywhere. And um, as we've heard from SIMAG members, if you're placed into areas with, you know, few asylum seeker refugee support organizations, you can just be left with no support um, and with 39 pounds a week to live off. Um, when you think about the childcare and the health complications that a lot of asylum seekers have, it's really not enough even to cover your sort of basic needs, not enough for subsistence. And, um, and yeah, a lot of the time um, we have this picture of asylum oh seekers God. as single young men and it's just not the reality. Um, everyone has their own needs and, um, you know, 39 pounds is, is not enough for anyone. Um, like think about things like phone bills and warm clothes and then there's nothing left. Um, and all whilst they're only getting 39 pounds a week from the home office, they're not allowed to work. So people could have come with these incredible skills and they're left without the ability to apply them. And this leads to de-skilling and frustration as people are just left waiting in limbo to hear back um, about their asylum claims, which can sometimes take years. Well, often. So that's a bit of a background and that's why, you know, we've come here today to talk about the right to work for asylum seekers. So um, before we get to our speakers, we're going to hear some statements um, from people with lived experience of the asylum system that SIMAB have collated um, and it's on their opinions on the right to work for asylum seekers. And I, I don't think I need to introduce them anymore. I think they kind of speak for themselves. So if I hand over um, to Rob now, he's gonna read um, two of those statements and then he'll hand back to me. Thank you, Lily. Good evening, everybody. I'm just gonna read a couple of testimonies. I am a 19 year old young man from the Middle East. I was 16 when I arrived in Britain from my warm torn country. I lived in a dormitory for more than a year and most of my friends settled down and left. During all this time, I lived on very little money and everyone around me worked illegally. My efforts to find work were also in vain. 
Eventually, I had to accept the offer to sell drugs that I had on the table from the first day I came here. Less than 10 days later, I was arrested by the police and sent to prison for 18 months. Was it not possible for me to work in a dignified manner from day one and not be forced to work illegally and then imprisoned? Another testimony. I am also from the Middle East and I came here four years ago with a family of five people, one of whom is disabled. From the first day, I was forced to work illegally because of the expenses of my disabled child. And since I knew the joiner well, I got a job very quickly. The thing that humiliated me so much during this time was that because I was not allowed to work, I always had to work at very low prices. There were many cases where the employer, knowing that I was a refugee and was not allowed to work legally, did not give me my money at all or promised to pay it to me in the near future, a future that was never possible. Thank you. I'm going to read a third testimony now. I am a woman. Although I am educated and fluent, in, and fluent in English, because I was a refugee, my employer always paid my salary, which I always had to do, um, which I always had to do even more hours, but the empl employer always paid me less. All this, except that the employer I was working for always, was always looking for my body to touch and enjoy sex with it. And I had to endure this all, not to lose my job. And now I'm going to hand over to Stuart to read another testimony. I am married in Africa and because of my family's living experiences, I had to work illegally in a grocery store for many years waiting for an answer from the Home Office. Interestingly, every night the policemen who worked night shifts came to our store and ate. The police officer always asked me for more food and a discount because I knew I was an asylum seeker and that I lived in a refugee house. I always obeyed him and stayed silent in order to keep my job. Thank you. Um, so those are some written statements of people that have been in the asylum system and um, not been able to work. I'm now going to hand over to um, Victor. He doesn't really need an introduction, but he is a member of SIMAG. He's a tireless campaigner in Sheffield, and um, I'm sure he'll tell you the rest about himself but welcome victor <laughs> thank you lily um thank you everyone for inviting me uh to talk about uh, my lived experience um as an asylum seeker um right up to the 29th uh, of january january this year i'd been uh, living as uh, an asylum seeker a refused asylum seeker and um, it was during that period um, uh, as an asylum seeker that um, I had been uh, involved, uh, involving myself in a lot of uh, vol volunteering because uh, as um, an asylum seeker or a refused asylum seeker, um, I was uh, not um, allowed to uh, work at all, this is a situation that uh, all asylum seekers, um, um, everybody, everyone who applies for asylum in this country uh, find uh, themselves in. Um, that right of um, get, getting gainful inflo uh, employment uh, gets taken away from you until such that, that time that um, once asylum case is determined and they've got um, a, a positive outcome. So for 12 years, I was um, in that situation as a refused asylum seeker, where I was not allowed to uh, get um, any uh, gainful employment simply because of, uh, of uh, my status. But um, before coming to this country, I he had been gainfully employed. Um, I used to work um, as a, a bank employee in the banking and finance sector. And I worked uh, in that sector for uh, 23 years before, before coming to this country. So I had been introduced to the world of work at uh, quite an early age. And um, until such time that I came, I came to this country and then applied for asylum. And that, uh, that, um, it, 
a, a right to work was then uh, taken away. And um, was my uh, asylum, uh, my, my uh, 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 re residence status um, uh, was still to be, to be determined. So in some way, the previous experience that I had um, uh, as a, a, a bank employee to cope with situation that I found myself in as an asylum seeker um, work um, is beneficial to uh, you could give somebody a key, um, um, it challenges you and uh, it's uh, a means of uh, developing oneself. It gives uh, a, a sense of pride and identity and personal achievement and um, enables you to interact to, to socialize uh, and build up contacts and uh, find support among a whole range of, um, a, of uh, groups of people. And above all, it um, it provides income and builds uh, somebody's um, uh, self-esteem. So when I was uh, told that I was an asylum seeker and could not uh, undertake any form of uh, meaningful employment, that was initially a hammer because uh, when I applied for I was still of uh, uh, a person of working age, about 15 years away from from uh, a, a retirement. And then um, I said to myself, what do I do under su such circumstances? Um, because denying the, uh, the, the, the access would, uh, was going to, I could see that it going to have a serious psychological effects of me on me let alone taking away a, a means of uh, means of sustenance so i that that uh, the previous things that i had of um uh, in in the world of work kicked in because i needed again to sort of um, build up a structure in my life because uh, not getting employed at all when you know that you could do something would take away that purposefulness that structure um, that is uh, usually found by anybody, or as we know, who gets uh, uh, engaged in, 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 in meaningful employment. So I say to myself, I need to uh, build a structure for myself so that uh, I could uh, 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 counter the effects of um, uh, 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 the counter the effects of uh, depression and stress and what you. Um, so I looked at, at a, a variety of organizations and then started planning, uh, doing some plans in the way of building a structure in terms of uh, a volunteering so that each and every day of the week, I had some kind of activity to do to keep me going uh, to have something to look forward to. And uh, in the terms of the structure that I had uh, when I was vol volunteering, I made sure that every day of the week, I had some tasks or activities that I had to undertake so that the whole, whole, the whole seven day week would be filled with uh, a, a kind of activity that will enable me to be uh, to be uh, occupied in, in some sort. So every Monday, I knew there was a task that I would, uh, that I would undertake as, um, 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 uh, on, on Mondays. And Tuesday, Tuesdays, they their own tasks. Wednesdays, Thursday, right up to, up, to, up, to, up to Saturday. And that type of structure that I, 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 I built uh, for myself helped me to cope with the stresses of... Uh, just sitting and loitering and not doing uh, anything at all. And it also helped me to um, not to think uh, 
seriously and not to be overwhelmed by the situation that um, that um, I found myself uh, um, as an asylum seeker. So it was a kind of uh, coping me mechanism. And um, people whom I worked closely with got to know me through the tasks that um, I, I, I used to undertake uh, on a daily basis uh, um, uh, every day for, uh, of the week. And they began to realize that uh, uh, whatever I was doing, he had a structure to it, there was a purpose to it. It wasn't something that was, uh, that was uh, uh, random. And that helped me to cope in uh, quite an immense way. And I could see the difference uh, between me and other uh, asylum seekers who didn't have this uh, this type of uh, that, that type of structure, so that experience that I had had in my previous work experience and in the world of work that I used to 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 uh, to be engaged in helped me to build up that structure, and uh, it uh, to some people it um, sort of. Um, uh, appeared like uh, it was uh, random uh, because people would see me doing that uh, one task on uh, a, on a particular day and then another task on a particular day it made a lot of sense because i knew that uh, these tasks were not overlapping they were all pre pre properly structured and that helped me to sort of uh, uh, cope and have uh, something to look forward to uh, on a daily basis. And indeed, um, th that helped him a, a lot. It helped with my mental health. It helped uh, to counter the effects of uh, depression. And it had uh, made me uh, uh, have something to, to look forward to. And um, uh, interestingly and surprisingly, the 12 year period that I was uh, an asylum seeker just flew by. Apart from key events, significant events that I encountered during that period, the whole period just uh, went by like that. And some people, and there were instances where I could uh, get negative comments from um, uh, it, it's certain individual, and in some instance, uh, fellow asylum seekers, why is Victor doing that? He's just working for nothing, for charities and what have you. And he did. Um, a lot of them uh, didn't see the purpose or the reason why I was doing it. I was merely doing it my own uh, mental health and my survival and to cope with the situation uh, that um, I found myself in. And um, during that period, again, I managed to develop myself in so many ways that um, it, 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 it astonished me because I started to engage with people. I started to engage with organizations. I was sent to um, a courses where I would undertake uh, the training. And um, then that training developed and improved me, I was uh, able to keep abreast with um, a developments, technology, and what have you, um, things that, uh, that helped me uh, in, in quite a, in, 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 in a lot of ways. And um, I was also able to undertake courses at Bansley College where I would go for eat, uh, IT classes and, 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 and things uh, and some such other things like that. So uh, really, um, uh, 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 these are the, 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 the things I was able to do personally, which I would also encourage other asylum seekers uh, um, to to do, um, particularly those that are still in the in the in the in the system. Um, for me personally, yes, um, I can see that um, I was able to do that because previously I'd been engaged engaged in gainful employment, uh, not so for other asylum seekers. Um, in my activities as a volunteer, I used to come across at the night shelter um, across young men. We'd come here as 13, 12, 10 year olds and um, as asylum, asylum seekers, and then they would stay in that system for a very, very long time. I remember, well, my son is one of them and several other young men um, who've, uh, whom I've come across. And um, when I looked at them, I really felt sorry for them. I said, 
these young men have crossed uh, international boundaries as kids return where they would do, they were expecting to either get uh, into education develop themselves and then get in gainful employment and uh, behave like any other young men of their age uh, ages uh, who are uh, members of the british society but unfortunately for them um, they were ne never able to achieve uh, um, what uh, they, 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 they intended to do because they got stuck in the system. Imagine coming into the asylum system. You are at the age of 12, 13 and 14. I know one young man. Um, I really was moved when I was talking to him when he showed me his picture a, a photograph when he came to this country when he was a 12 year old. You could see the baby face and the baby that was in him when he came here um, and um, he is now a 25 26 year old he's grown a full beard but he's never been exposed to any form of work and you say what a waste what a waste of time what a waste of skills what a waste of opportunity all this time has gone by for me, I'd been exposed to this uh, um, uh, 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 to, the, to the world of employment, but this ma young man will never be. All these opportunities are going uh, 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 passing him by, with uh, without the prospect of his situation ever getting regularized. But um, there is still um, hope um, for these young men, and um, I saw myself as um, a, a person who could uh, be there for him, them and give them advice and encouragement and say, even if you feel that um, you are losing um, a lot in, in terms of being in this situation and not seeing any hope for the future, um, life does just does not end simply because you are an, 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 an asylum seeker there are people um who have achieved uh, quite a lot usually towards the end of their lives i can um, talk about a person like uh, um uh, uh, say tom uh, the 100 year old uh, yeah, uh, gentleman who within 12 months last year campaigned for the NHS. Imagine from the time he fought in the Second World War, nobody knew him at all. And he, he started his campaign by walking to raise funds for the, for, for the NHS. And within that 12 month period, he had achieved national status, if not world status within 12 months. And then he got a knighthood. And then uh, some 13 months later, he was dead. And his name is now aged in the, in the, in the, in the history books. So um, yes, we may feel that we are losing out, but if we can take whatever uh, uh, experience that we are, we are going through at the moment and turn that into, into a positive, you'll find that all that, all those seem, seeming disadvantages may turn out to be to be uh, advantages. Um, thank, I think thank my you, time Victor. is up and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, Victor. That was um, really good. I just didn't want to stop you there. Um, so I forgot to mention before that we will be taking questions at the end. So um, if they come to your mind now, feel free to put them in the chat um, and I'll have a look through or you can wait and um, speak and everyone will get a chance to do that. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Um, Lucy Mablin from the University of Sh Sheffield, who's a political sociologist who writes a lot about the right to work for asylum seekers, and I'm sure she'll tell you more about that. So welcome, Lucy. Yeah, hi, thanks so much. And thank you to Victor. That was amazing advice and yeah, wonderful, inspiring story. Um, so obviously, you from the like the story the narratives that were read out and from what Victor was saying you don't need me to tell you how harmful these kinds of policies on welfare and work are for people who are waiting a for a decision on their asylum application um 
And so I'm not going to kind of labour that, but I am going to talk a bit about the purpose of this policy from the point of view of the Home Office and of successive governments um, based on my research with Home Office policymakers. And then, and that bit will be depressing. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about an alternative, which hopefully will be less depressing. So um, as I know, many people here will, will be aware and apologies if you know all of this, but since the early 2000s, asylum policy in the UK has really been dominated by the idea that most people seeking asylum today are not actually refugees, but are economic migrants seeking to cheat the system. And this idea that people who seek asylum are largely bogus is a popular word for it, began in the early 2000s. It, it came in response to particularly to a shift in the nationalities of people who were seeking asylum. So during the Cold War, there was very little concern with the mix of motivations in relation to fleeing persecution or seeking a better life. And, if, um, you know, people um, coming here would be expected to work as a part, normal part of starting a new life. But when people started to seek asylum from often formerly colonized countries in what was then called the Third World and is often now referred to as the Global South, they started to be construed as new asylum seekers and were generally assumed to be illegitimate by the Home Office. And there was also a widespread tabloid um, moral panic. So the UK government really since that time has tended to justify its highly restrictive asylum policies, some of them most restrictive in the world, on the basis that it's um, open to, that the system generally is open to abuse from bogus and they often um, uh, kind of represent it as bogus cheating young men particularly. So the Home Office then makes the lives of people who are awaiting a decision on their application for asylum as difficult as possible on the basis, basis that this will then deter other people. So they're forcing people who are here to live below the poverty line and denying them the right to work in order they imagine to sever pull factors for other people who have not yet arrived. So the Home Office wants asylum support rates to be very low because they believe adequate support will act as a pull factor. And from the point of view of the Home Office, they want to prevent people in the asylum system from integrating, from forming bonds and friendships and starting their lives. So they don't want people to work on that basis of integration. And the argument that people become isolated by being denied the right to work is actually evidence for them of the policy working rather than a problem. And the fact that people end up working illegally is not then a reason to give them a legal right to work from a home office perspective. It's a reason to expand the hostile environment and crack down on illegal working. Obviously, none of this is supported by the realities of people's lives, like Victor described, or by any of the research evidence from many studies that have been done globally on these issues. So there's no evidence from a vast array of research internationally to support the idea that deterrent strategies work or that economic pull factors for asylum seeking particularly are real. They simply cost lives and make journeys more dangerous. So after over the past decade, we really witnessed the slow death of asylum. It's become increasingly difficult, I think, to imagine alternatives. And there have been so many campaigns and protests and legal challenges over the past two decades. And scholars of migration policy like myself have written countless papers and books debunking the spurious claims by, made by the government and given lots of presentations at the Home Office and challenged their policies in various ways. But in spite of all of this and all of this kind of activity for so long, so intensively, these recent policies announced by Priti Patel have seem now to be even worse, to be taking the policies even further than we really imagined they would. And I wonder in part if what we fail to do is offer convincing alternatives which really capture the public imagination. And I understand the focus of this kind of series of talks is to um, is to start to talk about alternatives. So that's something I really welcome. And so I wanted to talk a little bit um, now at the end of, of my talk about a new book that I recently read called A Modern Migration Theory by a Swedish professor of migration studies called Peo Hansen, 
And in this book, he offers us an example of an alternative policy approach. And it's not a utopian proposal of open borders or no borders. It's the real experience of Sweden, a kind of natural experiment, if you like, with proven success. So I'll sort of tell the story now at the end of my talk. So during 2015, as we, we all know, of course, large numbers of people were displaced as the Syrian civil war escalated. And most people stayed within the region with millions of people being hosted um, in Turkey, Jordan and Lebanon particularly. But a smaller proportion decided to travel onwards from these places to Europe. Um, and because of the fortress-like policies adopted by European countries, there were no safe and legal routes um, aboard aeroplanes or ferries. Um, and so we had the kind of scenes in sort of Southern Europe that we all saw on the news. And most European countries refused to take part in burden sharing. And so it fell to Germany and Sweden, the only countries that really opened their doors in any meaningful way to host these new arrivals. And 163,000 people arrived in Sweden that year. So that's a country of 10 million people. By contrast, 30,000 people applied for asylum in the UK this year, and we have 66 million um, population. And in his book, Peo Hansen documents what really happened next in Sweden. So first, the Swedish state ended austerity in an emergency response to the ch challenge of hosting so many refugees. And as part of this, the Swedish state distributed almost unprecedented funds across the local authorities of the country to help them in receiving the refugees. Um, then this money was spent not just on hosting refugees, but on the infrastructure needed to support an increased population in a given area. So on schools and hospitals and housing. And as in Sweden, uh, sorry, as in Britain, in Sweden, um, the government had up to this point spent some years fetishizing the budget deficit. And there was an assumption that spending so much money would worsen the fiscal position that it would lead to both inflation and a massive national deficit, which must later be repaid. And that this spending on refugees would cause deficits and hence necessitate borrowing and tax heights and budget cuts was presented by politicians and the media in Sweden as basically a foregone conclusion. And this foregone conclusion was then used as part of a narrative about refugees' negative impact on the economy and welfare and as the basis for closing Sweden's doors to people seeking asylum in the future. And yet actually the budget deficit never materialized just as the finance minister had buried any hope of surpluses in the near future and repeated the mantra that the, the need to borrow to finance the refugees. A tidal wave of tax revenue started to engulf Sweden. So the economy grew and tax revenue surged in 2016 and 17 so much that successive surpluses were created. So in 2016, public consumption increased 3.6%, a figure not seen since the 1970s. And growth rates were almost Chinese, like 4% in 2016 and 17. So refugees are also then filling labor shortages in understaffed sectors, such as social care, where Sweden's aging population is in real need of demographic renewal. And refugees disproportionately ended up in smaller, poorer, depopulating rural municipalities who also received a disproportionately large cash injection from the government. So the arrival of refugees addressed sort of triple challenges for these areas, challenges of depopulation and population aging, a previous loss of tax revenue because of the aging population, which forced a cut in services, and severe staff shortages and recruitment problems in the care sector. So rather than responding with hostility, the local authorities rightly saw the refugee influx as potentially solving these spiraling challenges for them. I think for two decades now, we've been witnessing this slow death of asylum in the UK and basing policy on prejudice rather than evidence and suspicion rather than generosity and really burden rather than opportunity. Every change in the asylum system seems to herald new and innovative ways of circumventing human rights and detaining and deporting and impoverishing and excluding people. And none of this is cheap, of course, it's 
not done for the economic benefit of the British population. It costs £15,000 to deport someone. It costs £95 a day to detain them. Just vast sums of money are spent um, giving, well, really given to private companies every year to help in the work of denying people who are seeking sanctuary the right to asylum. And I think the Swedish case offers a window into what happens when a different approach is taken. The benefit um, of supporting refugees, including supporting them to work, isn't simply to refugees, but to the population as a whole. And I, I find this a really powerful argument, and I'd love to know what you think about it as well. Thank you so much, Lucy. That was absolutely fascinating and I hadn't heard about that case study before so thank you for sharing it with us and um, I'm really liking how this talks bring together lived experience with academia. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Mary from the Lift the Ban coalition. So Lift the Ban is a 240 member strong coalition of kind of charities, trade unions, businesses and faith groups campaigning to overturn the government's policy banning the right to work. So I'm sure Mary will tell us more about that. Thanks Lillian and um, thanks everyone for the talks so far. They're just um, truly inspiring. Um, and I thought I would talk a little bit today about um, the Lift the Ban campaign, a bit of the backstory and where it's kind of come from and um, and also a bit about where we're at now and some of the challenges we're facing looking um, looking forwards. Um, so as Lucy mentioned earlier, the policy um, banning the right to work was brought in in 2002 by the then Labour government. And this was during an, another of these times um, that Lucy referred to of the um, moral panic in the media a lot of kind of negativity being built up and the excuse given at the time was that decisions on asylum claims were being made so quickly that um, there was no need for people to have permission to work uh, but as we all know over the years the backlog has um, grown bigger and bigger and the kind of creaking infrastructure of the home office has um, worsened and, and people wait much much longer to um, have a resolution on, on their cases, but still the policy remains in place. And over the last couple of decades, there's been lots of campaigning, lots of fighting to change this. There's been um, EDMs in um, proposals in parliament before even 2010. Um, and then in 2016, there was even a, an amendment uh, by the Lords that was passed in the Lords to the immigration Act as it was going through in 2016. And um, even though the Lords were able to pass an amendment allowing the right to work, it was voted down in the Commons. So um, no, no one from Labour attended that vote. Um, so it was inevitably passed through. But I think it goes to show that there's been a lot of work for a long time on this. And it's, it's something people are really passionate about. But we needed to get organised to make things happen and, and see progress. So that's what we, all the charities that started and set up the Lift the Ban campaign in, in 2018 tried to do. We were kind of surveying the scene, the new political landscape, and it felt like a real opportunity. Uh, on the one hand, we had um, a conservative minority government and the parliamentary arithmetic was there to be able to have that route to change through legislation, you know, the numbers add up well, and if we can convince enough MPs to support us, we could achieve real change. Um, and at the same time, we had a government who had been shamed of the back of the Windrush scandal and were desperate to show that they were um, more humane and the terrain was promising. And we, we got together that I think there were originally 80 members of the coalition, but like Lily said, there's 250 now. And with that broad, wide, diverse support from not just charities and the usual suspects, but unions and businesses and faith groups um, and trade associations, you know, there was this real kind of broad church of, of voices and, and actors who started to 
speak out and start to get this more widely in the public consciousness. So we had real success at the start. Um, it, by the end of 2018, the government had agreed to review the policy and Sajid Javid, the Home Secretary at the time, had even said, oh, it's time for reform. And we felt like the kind of winds of change were coming in. But obviously then in 2019, the, the world as we know it changed and, and we're working in a really, really difficult, very different political environment. Um, so that's where we're up, up to now. And I thought it would be good to discuss some of the challenges that are going on right now, in part because I know that Massey are here and I'm really eager to hear their response and thoughts on, on overcoming some of these challenges. Um, so first and foremost, we now have a conservative majority in parliament, as you all know. So those routes to change that we previously had really put a lot of hope and passion and, and stall in proposing uh, changes through parliament are a lot harder to get through. And it kind of removes some of the pressure that we had to our advantage. So we could use the fact that we had um, momentum built up in parliament previously to put pressure on the Home Office to, to consider a, a policy change without requiring that route through parliament. We don't have that anymore. And we have a, a government and, and many MPs who perceive the public to be hostile to progressive policies on immigration. So for example, in the red wall seats, that there's that belief that um, the people who voted in new Conservative MPs over traditional Labour MPs did so because of an anti-immigration feeling. And that's what we're, we're kind of having to tackle. We're having to build up people's new MPs, new decision makers awareness of the issue anew and, and make sure that they understand the myths that are told about it. Like Lucy was, was speaking about the myths that um, banning the right to work is a deterrent and it, and it stops people coming here. Of course it, it doesn't, it just makes life hell for people who, who come here and, and it, it loses the country a great deal um, in human cost and, and economic cost. Um, so it's it's been challenging kind of starting from scratch again having lost some of our previous parliamentary champions and and yeah ha having to start from square one then bring into that the whole situation with with covid you know obviously we've been facing the same challenges that all activists everywhere are facing um, it's, it's, we used to do events and marches and we climb mountains to draw attention to the, this injustice, but all of that's really hard now. But I think it's brought some, some new opportunities. So meetings like this where we can, we can connect and, and share our, our ideas and bring in new voices to the campaign. Um, and, and also we've been trying to use online tools for, for raising our voices. So back in October last year, we had a petition of over 180,000 signatures from people across the UK. And we handed that into the Home Office and got Lift the Band trending on Twitter. So um, it was a good way to show just how um, the numbers behind this, how many people support it. Um, so we're just trying to adapt how we can. Um, another adaptation is, using um, the, the circumstances to raise the voices of people who otherwise might not have had a platform. So for example, we've been, um, we've been working with the media to raise the voices of healthcare workers who have been banned from helping even though they're desperate to get on the front line and support with the pandemic and they have the skills and the talent to do so, but they're unable to. So that's been a new way to tell those otherwise hidden stories and perhaps bring in new new allies to this. So off the back of those voices speaking out, we had the BMA um, join the coalition and, and we're speaking to, um, one minute left, oh, um, others. So um, that brings me on to another um, challenge, I suppose, which is, is the messaging in this campaign, navigating the, the complexities of the messaging, uh, because it's very easy to fall into the good migrant, bad migrant dichotomy 
if we are advocating for um, those with skills to have, you know, have the right to work um, and, and platforming those with skills when really we need to make sure that when we're advocating for the right to work that it's from a rights based approach and, and it's because we're ask, asking and, and demanding that all people have this human right to work and that no one deserves to or should be prevented from the from providing for themselves and their families at great cost to their mental health their physical health their access to opportunities um, so our plan is to keep chipping away rebuild the the opposition support that we used to enjoy um, you know and under Jeremy Corbyn the right to work was Labour Party policy that is no longer so it's still worth raising this with Labour MPs and getting that support strong um, it's bringing new allies on board, bringing any new Tories up to speed on, on this injustice and the fact that the government is um, missing out on 98 million per year that it could be gaining just in order to dehumanise people and keep them on the margins of society. That's, that's the cost. So it's raising awareness of that to bring new allies in. And it's just keeping going with the, the, the grassroots stuff that everyone um, we work with is so good at getting motions, passing councils, holding events like this, and just kind of keeping our keeping our our spirits and our chins up. I think because with everything that's going on at the moment, it feels like we have we're hide, we're holding the line and we're fighting for very basic rights. But I I feel that it's also important to keep fighting for progress and progressive reform, whilst also um, putting our energies into protecting what is there currently. So uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm really looking forward to learning from Massey about, um, about how what we could learn with our campaign. And if anyone's interested, I'll just post a link to our, our local activism pack in, in the side. It just gives some really great examples of, of stuff that folk in the coalition have been doing over the last few years in case it's inspiring. Thanks for having me. Thanks Mary, that that was really inspiring to hear, just hear you talk and I think we all need a bit of hope in these times. So as Lucy alluded to, I'm now going to hand over to Lucky um, from Massey, which stands for the Movement of Asylum Seekers in Ireland. Massey is an independent platform for asylum seekers to join together in unity and purpose, and it seeks justice, freedom and dignity for all asylum seekers in Ireland. So I think we're about to hear about how they've done that for the right to work for asylum seekers in Ireland. So hand over to you, Lucky. I think you're muted, Lucky, at the moment. It looks like we're having some technical difficulties. That's fine. Um, Can you hear me now? Yep, that's great. Thank you, uh, and good evening, everybody. And uh, it's nice to 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 be in your midst and uh, exciting uh, presentations from various people there, which I enjoyed, uh, Victor. Wonderful there. Uh, yeah, my name is Ilaki. Uh, originally, I come from South Africa, and uh, I've been in uh, in Ireland now for the past eight eight years. I came as an asylum seeker. Uh, I also, you know, I resonate with uh, the story, Victor's story, and it sits just well with 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 me and. Uh, with the way that also asylum seekers are treated when they come in the country, uh, whereby you you would have that same experience that he had of, of 20, 23 years in, in the financial sector. And when you come in the country, you are just relegated to a zero. Uh, every right is stripped away from you. And that's what I experienced as well when I came here was the fact that, gosh, for the first time, I, I'm, I'm unable to work, not because of lack of anything, just because this is a system that has been put in place, as Lucy as well just alluded in terms of her research, 
And it's exactly what I found when I, come, when I came here, that one, I could not be able to work. Two, I was living in a overcrowded kind of a place uh, where I could not be able to cook uh, 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 your own meal. You have got no rights to further your education or study or training or whatever that you wanted to do. All what you're experiencing was the discrimination, the oppression, and uh, the eating, sleeping. That is what you 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 are you are bound to do, and uh, you are also noted or, or a roll call, so to speak, to say that you are present in the center, in the center where I was, where about our three hundred people in in that center, and. Uh, you have to report every day that you are present. Otherwise, if you if you not go and sign that you are present, you are taken as 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 absent, and you get a warning, and you can you can also be evicted by the fact that you did not sign, even if you have been there. So it all these degrading kind of uh, uh, things that were because I came to to a place called Balseskin here, which is a reception center. When you come and seek asylum here, you go to the reception center uh, where you are processed, uh, your, your, applica your initial application and your initial interview. And then after some time, then you are moved to a more permanent place uh, in, in a hostel uh, kind of setup in and around uh, everywhere in the country. And I was moved to a, 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 a place called Cork. Uh, for 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 about three years i was staying there experiencing this it 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 just something that i could i could i could not really take it i could not take it uh but i decided to do something about it uh, and uh, because of the fact that also when you're an asylum seeker your dignity is taken away from you your 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 freedom is taken away from you uh, you, 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 you don't have your self-esteem, you don't have the confidence, you don't have anything, you are so empty inside, uh, whatever that you try, you can't be volunteering every time. But in, in that experience, we decided in Cork that we, it's about time as asylum seekers that we get together and talk about these issues and see what is it that we can do more than the system, what it's doing to us, but what can we do together? And we started talking about unifying people, talking about people understanding how wrong this thing is. it is, because a system that works for the oppressor is to make the oppressor don't feel oppressed, don't feel that he is trapped in a situation. Make they normal, I make you to see these things as normal in your head manipulate your head in such a way that you don't see anything wrong because you get your food, you get your bed and nothing else. So it's something that we had to resist in our minds to get the people to understand that. So the, the birth of mercy was because of that. Uh, we decided that we, 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 we have to protest and we had a, pro a, a, a lockout protest there in Cork in 2014 whereby we took over the center as, as, the, as, the, as the residents, kicked away the staff for 10 days while we were negotiating on things that we needed to change in that center where we are living. Notwithstanding the actual policy that governs the people, uh, here the system is called direct provision. So, but there is a difference between the direct provision side of things, which is the accommodation side of things, and the actual international protection application or act which governs the actual process of uh, people uh, 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 unable to work or, or applications taking long, all that. One of the demands that we had was the a, a right to work because then 100% you could not be able to work. One of our demands which we cried from that time was the, the right to work, was the right to work. Uh, and to end that system of direct provision and to provide education for, for people. Uh, 
We carry it on with the campaign, with campaign, with protest. We go to the, you call it the home office, we call it the justice office here. We call, we go there, we protest. They make so many reports. There was a report that was made in 2015, which was made as well to, to quell down the fire that was burning within us because we started now uh, 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 mobilizing the other centers as well to protest uh, for their rights. To we, we, our aim was to make the system to be ungovernable, uh, but what, what they did was to, to, to create that report so that people can have hope and be quiet about things, uh, but nothing really did change. And uh, we are still here up to now. Uh, then Marcy came. Uh, we, we started this group in 2014 up to now. All right, uh, fighting for the for the rights of asylum seekers. Uh, in 2018, we had a victory, uh, a mini victory, I would say, because from then uh, the government was forced to give the asylum seekers the right to work. They did do that with some restrictions, okay. And I agree 100% with the, with the Dr. Lucy there in terms of. Uh, because the, the, they made direct provision to be as painful as it is, as hard as it is, for the same reason to deter people from coming in here and to spread the word for, from, to going out that don't come to Ireland or maybe UK, you will, you will die there, you know? So it, it's very, very true. So, but in 2018, People will, are now allowed to, 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 to work with some restrictions, like the restriction was that it must be for six months and you must not have received a negative uh, response on your application. Uh, and also uh, that you need to, there was, a, there was uh, some sectors that you could not be able to work at, uh, but uh, we still continue to campaign for the proper right to work because it was restrictive, very much restrictive. Uh, until now, uh, what has happened now is that, uh, or you had to wait for nine months as well to get that right to work, but we were campaigning for zero months because it happens somewhere else. So all in all, what Masi has been doing is to, is to be the voice, our own voice, Masi is just the voice of the people. It's called the movement of asylum seekers in Ireland. It's the voice of the people speaking. You know, the voice that has been taken away from, from people to speak about your own, our own experience, like what Dita is, 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 is sharing here. We, 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 we promote that people must be able to stand up and speak up and not take asylum as a crime. It's not a crime to seek asylum. It's a fundamental human right that people must be able to be protected and be treated like any other human being. So that's what Masi is doing, is promoting that. And also one of the activities that we do in moving forward, more than we fight the government, people don't like the fact that we fight the government, but we keep fighting the government because they fight us with regard to these restrictions. We, 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 we bulldoze our way to education uh, and also facilitate for people to be able to get to education. What we have been doing also with, to, uh, with this pandemic when people now are, are, are not able to go to school or everything is done online, we ran a campaign of laptops and, and iPads for the kids. I think more than 500 kids now have, have iPads which they are, uh, uh, are using and over 300 laptops went to the others who are studying uh, online now. So there's loads of things that people can do uh, when they focus on, 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 on not just being handout kind of a thing. Uh, we, we want people to be able to drive, which it is not it's prohib it's prohibited here. Yeah? We want people to be able to drive, to be able to open bank accounts so that when they get work, they can be able to go to work because transport here is a mess. So all those things are the things that we bring to the notice of the government to say that this, you need to change. The white paper came now. There are things that are good about it, 
there are things that still need to improve as far as that is concerned. So that is that is that I'll I'll stop there because of time, uh, so that people when they have questions, uh, they can ask questions. Thank you, Lucky. Um, I particularly enjoyed the we bulldozed our way to education. I thought that was particularly like powerful. Um, I'm just going to give all the speakers a minute now before we open the floor for questions. And whilst I'm doing that, I'm just going to um, say that um, Otto is going to put some links in the chat now for some fundraisers um, for uh, members of the community in Sheffield. Um, and they'll explain themselves. Um, but just please keep an eye on the chat um, have a look at them afterwards. And there's also a link to the UK Mutual Aid Network. Um, so yeah, please keep an eye on them. Right, so now I'm gonna open the floor to questions from the panel. Um, you can put them in the chat as well. I know, but I know that not everyone wants to type, so um, feel free to speak. If you can put up your hand, that would be great. But if you don't know how to do that, I mean, you can. Um, that's fine, you can just take your microphone off. So does anyone have a question they'd like to ask any of the members of the panel? Um, uh, Dave? Yeah, uh, I mean, the right to work, why aren't we following Europe or even in the US? Six months, they will kick you out. They will ask you to go and work if you're an asylum seeker. I mean, in Spain and stuff like that, or Canada, the day one you're allowed to work. So maybe that should be an example, isn't it? Mm, thank I think you, Dick. There, are, there are different policies across Europe, ranging from Sweden is the shortest at zero, but across like across the European Union, it ranges from three to nine months. We opted out of the protocols that mean that it would be, we've got a maximum of, we go up to 12 months now, I think, but, um, and have the shortage occupation list, but there are countries that it varies across the European Union, basically. And it, it's not just from day one. No, no, in Canada, in Spain, it's day one, you, you get to work and you have six months, they will send you out. And Netherlands, you have to work 50% to get for your housing. So, uh, if we look towards the US, why aren't we following the 